Okay, hello everyone to all those joining us for the webinar today. Karibu sana, as we say in Tanzania, and most welcome. Good morning, good afternoon. My name is Farhan Yusuf. I am a pharmacist in Tanzania and also the co chairperson for the IAPHL Tanzania chapter. IAPHL, which uh, you know stands for International Association of Public Health Logisticians, is the host of this uh, webinar today, where we will be talking about artificial intelligence and health supply chains in Tanzania, introduction to an AI playbook. Uh, for those who may not know, International Association of Public Health Logisticians is a network or a group or a forum of public health logisticians and health supply chain experts, learners uh, that does a lot of sharing. At the end of the webinar, for those of you who are not yet members, we will share some information about uh, how to join this network to increase your knowledge and understanding of health supply chains. Uh, so before I start off, I would like to take this moment to for my panelists to introduce themselves and you know say hi to the audience that is joining us. Uh, starting off with Benjamin, please introduce yourself. Thank you, Farhan. My name is Benjamin Fells, and I'm the CEO of, of a company called MacRise. And we see our, our mission as making crucial systems predictive. And these are very often health supply chains, our whole health systems. So essentially shifting how a system works from being reactive to being able to anticipate risk and opportunity and then better manage it. And we'll talk more about how this involves AI in the, in the conversation ahead. Thank you for, for having me here. Thank you, Benjamin. That's a good way of setting the stage, I must say. Next up, we have Isa. Uh, hi, everyone. I... I manage the Tanzania AI Lab, which is a community of artificial intelligence enthusiasts and practitioners here in Tanzania, uh, working to upskill themselves, uh, exchange value with one another, and most importantly, applying the technology for good and making sure that as more needs for predictive systems come in, we have the people on ground who are able to jump right on board. Thank you, Isan. And lastly, we have Harrison. Hello, everyone. My name is Harrison Mariki. I am a pharmacist. I work for an NGO called In Supply Health. Um, what we do is we help co-create uh, innovation for public health supply chains. And um, I have uh, some experience working in the Tanzania health supply chain sector for the past nine years and very excited always to be um, joining the innovations that have uh, always uh, helped us to move from one stage of our supply chain success to another. So very happy to be discussing this um, playbook, which is, I, think, I believe is another milestone for us. Thank you. Thanks a lot, Harrison. And for those of us who have joined us, you can see we have quite an interesting panel of speakers today with varying, varying expertise rather and interest in supply chains, in health, in artificial intelligence. So, and a very interesting webinar being set up. Uh, next slide, please. So before we get into the crux of the webinar today, just some few you know, technical announcements. Please use the Zoom Q&A function to pose any questions during the presentation. We'll be keeping track of the questions. And you know, we have dedicated some time for question and answer at the end of the session. So you know, we'll definitely try to address as many of them as possible. For those that we may not be able to address, uh, we will say how we are going to respond to them a bit later in the webinar. So let's jump right into it. Next slide, please. Okay, so uh, I think you know, the first panelists, you know, who will help us understand a little bit about artificial intelligence, you know, which is a buzzword right now. We hear a lot about this. We hear about it as an emerging technology, something that is coming up. Uh, Benjamin, can you please tell us, you know, what exactly is artificial intelligence and also what fields are already using this technology? 
Thank you, Farhan. Uh, so I think it's important to start out by uh, going back in history a little bit um, and, and reminding all of us that, that artificial intelligence is, is not an emerging technology. Um, the underlying mathematics, the underlying way of using um, data, learning from data has been in place since the 1950s. What is new is the speed and scale at which artificial intelligence is really a part of almost every major part of the world around us, um, from aeronautics to, to the internet to, to food. Um, I wanna talk a little bit about the difference between artificial intelligence or machine learning and traditional systems. And the way that I like to think about this is that the, the, the key term here, and really the, from, from my perspective, the most important element for us all to, to think about when we think about what is AI is this notion of learning. A, a conventional system, whether that's a piece of software to understand or organize a supply chain, or whether that's an epidemiological model to understand how a disease progresses. In, in either way, conventionally, these systems are built by hand. There's an expert who designs a set of rules and those rules dictate the output of the system, whether it's a model or a piece of software. What's really unique about AI is that the system essentially learns the rules directly from the data. So the person who is designing the machine learning system doesn't put in place a set of rules or a set of guidelines. They design a, a way such that the system can learn directly from the data, learn, think about it as the structure. And what's really important here is that that allows a machine learning system to continue to keep in touch with ground truth, to continue to keep in touch with new sets of data, new information, new observations, um, a new way in which the world operates. And that's really why I think AI has a, an, an unfair advantage at using data to predict what is likely to happen next. So maybe we can go to the, the next slide and talk a little bit about how it's being used today. So, I want to start with, with an example that, that I find quite astounding. Um, so we are all interacting over the internet and the internet is the product of a series of very large, very expensive data centers across the world. And these data centers are filled with millions of servers or computers that are linked together and enable all the work and play that, that happens over the internet to occur. These are um, extremely carefully engineered machines, a data center that are very, very expensive. They're highly performant. When the technology company Google allowed the heating and cooling of their data centers to be controlled by an artificial intelligence system, they realized energy savings of 40%. This is akin to a Formula One race car, an almost perfect machine with one new element being able to go 40% faster. It's, it's, it's almost unprecedented. Um, and again, I think that that's possible because of this capability to learn, to learn from patterns of how energy is used, to learn from patterns of how these machines function, to be able to much better organize the necessary elements. Let's, let's go to the next page. Um, and, and here I want to talk about an example that is relevant to Tanzania. So this is a supply chain um, and it's a supply chain for vaccines. So just in the same way that we looked at how Google learns from data um, generated by processes and systems to better optimize how those systems work. Here we have an example about learning from data that describes consumption or utilization of vaccines at the site level, 
learning from satellite imagery that describes environment, learning from public data, learning from data that the government of Tanzania publishes um, that describes the population. And being able to much more clearly anticipate or predict demand for vaccines, what exactly is going to be used in the days and weeks and months ahead based upon that learning. So in Tanzania, we deploy a, a core machine learning system that we've now deployed elsewhere in the world um, that cut the margin of error for forecasting down to less than 2%. So it's a margin of error between one and three vials for every hundred that are used. Again, this sort of precision, this sort of capability to anticipate when and where precisely demand is going to change, I believe is only possible with machine learning. And again, it's only possible because of this core capability to learn across many different types of data and learn in a way that if all of us sat in a room together, we might miss some of those patterns in the data. So back to you, Farhan. Thanks a lot, Ben, for that description. I must confess, I've always been, I have, you know, someone who takes a lot of time in understanding these. I'm a tech enthusiast, but not exactly uh, an early understander of, of tech, if I may put it that way. But I think your explanation today uh, makes a lot of difference in making it clear what exactly AI is. And I, I'm happy to stand corrected that it is not an emerging technology. Now, uh, thank you for also presenting this example from Tanzania, right? Because I've had numerous conversations with, with people uh, whereby, you know, there's this kind of dismissal that, you know, AI, it's so advanced, we can't have something like that in Tanzania. And so that is why I think, you know, we have Isa on the panel, who is someone this is his playground, basically. This is where he functions. So, Isa, I think you know you can perhaps take it up, take it up a notch, and tell us uh, how has AI been used in Tanzania, and why is Tanzania positioned so well to use AI at this moment? Sure. Thank you. So, <clears throat> well, first of all. Um, there are quite a few applications here, be it startups, be it at uh, different levels in supply chains or such. A lot of people have been playing with the tech for more than a couple of years now. Uh, solutions such as Ishangazi, which work through chatbots and social media to provide SRH support, have been around for almost five years now. And the existence of these solutions and these startups is one of the reasons why the AI lab, which I manage, exists in the first place, that we saw there was already an existence of these solutions out there and they were just more siloed or they wouldn't advertise or talk about themselves because a lot of the people who are working on this tech are very hardcore coders or developers and are heads down in their desks and computers working on it. Um, they're not the type to go over social media and talk about it. So that's where we brought the community to bring these people together to create some sort of value exchange, because we know that Africa's biggest strength is its youth population. And it's these youth who are upskilling themselves, especially with digital skills now that they're more available. And as the need for uh, predictive technologies, data center technologies is getting more apparent. These are the youth who are going to be the ones to skill themselves to be able to make impact with the technology. So these are some of the reports that are actually out there that you can access, uh, which talk about existing solutions implemented in uh, Tanzania, as well as some case studies, um, which uh, on how it could be implemented. And you'll find a lot of these case studies as well inside the new playbook, which we'll talk about a bit later. So there are a lot of solutions. Some of them uh, we can see, I believe it was on the... Okay, uh, so Dr. Elsa is one I talk about a lot that works in differential diagnosis. They support in rural areas, uh, healthcare workers to be able to make better informed diagnostics. And these are just a couple that are out there. It's we are seeing a lot of growth and now in higher learning institutions, uh, universities are getting more active in it. 
so there is quite a lot of it. We have been seeing the application for a couple of years now in, in the country that we know of. I'm pretty sure there are some applications that no one's talking about just yet. We haven't unearthed. So when they do come out, it is going to be interesting. So yeah, it's been around and it's going to be around. Thank you so much for that, Issa. So what you're basically telling us is that AI is already here and it's here to stay. Uh, you know, we have the capacity, we have the talent, we seem to have the solutions, you know, around. So thank you for, for that. So guys, you heard it, it's already here. Uh, now, I, you know, the main theme or the main topic of the webinar today is not just AI, but AI in supply chains, health supply chains in particular, and we are here to talk about a playbook. But before we, we go to that, uh, Ben, can you tell us why, you know, in supply and macro eyes first decided or thought about how did you think about, how did the two of you think about developing this playbook? So I think about this as a, as a, as a means to, to de-risk an idea. Um, we, we know that, that, that the technology is ready. It, it, it's deployed. Um, it's showing remarkable results across the world um, at huge scale, at very tiny scale. Um, what we have seen is that there are people in organizations across the world who are hesitant about AI. Um, and that hesitancy, we believe, comes from the fact that there isn't enough clarification. There isn't enough visibility into how might this work for me? What's the process? What are the steps? What's required from my side? What are the risks and the opportunities? What might go right? What might go wrong? And what we're proposing here is a way to engage with all those questions, essentially engage with deploying AI before you do so. It's a, it's a kind of practice run. Um, it's, a, it's a way to think through those steps, think through what you will do, um, what your organization will do, so that when you are ready, you're prepared and you have an idea of, 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 of what's going to happen next. That said, we, and, and, and I'll emphasize this again, we strongly encourage everyone who's participating in this webinar to engage with the playbook and then to engage with the technology directly. So this is preparation, but to best understand AI, the best way to do that is to work with it directly in a domain that matters to you. And, 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 and then you'll see the significance. But we hope that this playbook is, again, is a way to, to practice, to think through the steps and to understand so that you can engage with this new technology in a way that there's less risk, there's more understanding, there's more confidence. Back to you, Father. Thank you, Ben. So, you know, after knowing the, the thought process behind the playbook, Harrison, you now get the opportunity to unearth what exactly this playbook is. People have been hearing playbook, playbook, and I'm sure some are wondering what this is. So you get to tell us what is the playbook and what is inside it. Um, th thank you, Farhan. Um, so I, I would like to think of this as a, a, a three-decade tale, uh, starting with the 2000s when um, the government decided to start the um, ILS, which is the Integrated Logistic Systems, where we started using paperwork actually to uh, collect supply chain data to help with decision making. And that went along for more than 10 years and was very successful because before that implementation, we had very little data to um, do that. But when we were doing that, we also like worked on uh, some guidance on how we'll do that and who will train, how we'll start, how we'll not add more work to the healthcare workers and why it was important for, for that tool to be integrated and incorporate all those programs. Again, in the 2010s, 
uh, we saw the push to digital, and that's the beginning. That was the beginning of digitizing um, the healthcare supply chain in Tanzania with the ELMIS, uh, the Electronic Logistics Management Information System. Uh, also, uh, we saw the DHIS2 also take on um, the vaccines information management system also. And so uh, right now we have in, both, in all these systems, we have around seven to 10 years of data that's there. So what these systems have uh, succeeded to do is they have improved availability of data. Uh, they are also um, successful in telling us what happened, really, uh, like what really happened. And so um, in this new decade that is coming, and, and this is like the future of healthcare supply chain, um, what we are seeing is uh, the future would require us to look ahead and be able to offer uh, the clients the, the services that they need. So that's why we, we saw the importance of uh, um, um, trying to steward the, the process towards AA, AAI as uh, uh, Benjamin has shown the potential of the, of the technology, and I think we have had ESA as well uh, talking of how this is being implemented in other sectors. And so uh, this playbook really is a way to show uh, like what are the practical steps. So similar to when we are introducing the ELMIS, uh, even then when we're introducing it, uh, in the class you'll find maybe three to four, only three to four people having email addresses by then. So. Uh, you, you really needed some guidance to decide how you will go about that. The same with this, I know there is some hesitancy, thinking this is far ahead, but we have to start now because uh, with digital, uh, the, the results can be very exponential soon if we start now, but carefully. So this shows us uh, the, those steps that we can take now, but as well, like what steps we need to take so that the solutions are integrated, the solutions are scalable, uh, to be able to reach the more than 6,000 health facilities in Tanzania, but also like uh, sustainable, being able to sustain the technology. So like, what are the what are the steps that we can take? But also speaks about the theory of change, which are now the, like the enabling environment that is needed uh, for this. Uh, the playbook also is full of use cases similar to uh, what the others have shown of what is happening in Tanzania and globally. Um, so it's really a tool and a guide to help has built uh, scalable and sustainable AI solutions in our health supply chain. Thank you. Thank you for that, Harrison. And you know, I think it's very interesting that you guys decided to call it a playbook and not an instruction manual because we know no one reads those anymore, anymore right? So, so thank you for for that piece of ingenuity. Uh, while we are still with you, Harrison, can you tell us about? You know, so how was this tool developed? What methods or processes were used? Yeah, um, thank you, Farhan. So when we started this work, we took a very user-centered approach. Uh, we, we engaged stakeholders across the different levels of supply chain. Uh, we spoke to the ministries. Uh, both the MOH, uh, the PRAG. We even then we look at the different departments like the ICT uh, department, but also the, um, those who are dealing with the uh, commodities themselves, the uh, PSU. Uh, we we spoke with uh, AI technology providers, both uh, all practitioners here in Tanzania, but globally, uh, implementing partners who are currently supporting the uh, healthcare supply chains to learn on how the best way would be to take on this technology. So it was a very collaborative process and uh, it involved a wide range of stakeholders. Um, so it's very user-centered. We have we had more than uh, three uh, workshops uh, that uh, we were gaining, but also we did some interviews. Uh, I think even COVID did not stop us to make sure that uh, we gathered enough uh, feedback from the users. And now, so we, we, we are going back and this is one of the process that we are taking share this and keep improving on it. And, and that's why it's a playbook because uh, you know with playbooks, the, uh, we, we change and adapt to make sure that we meet what is needed and make sure that we are successful. It's not a physical guideline. And I think AI and this technology does not need something that is static. We need even the SOPs to be very fluid as we are moving forward. Thank you. Thank you for that, Harrison. Ben, I see you're nodding. Do you have anything to add to this? 
No, I, I, I just, I like how Harrison said that, that it's not static. Um, and, and that just reinforces the, the, the power of AI as a technology. So, so it's appropriate that this is, this is a living thing. That's the whole point is that you're, you're building systems that can learn. So just as the playbook itself learned from, from interaction with experts, learn from interaction with different communities, the whole objective of, of the technology is that it's, it's a way to learn. It's a way to learn at remarkable scale in remarkable ways. Back to you, Farhan. Uh, thank you for that, Ben. And yeah, personally, I think I love the robustness of this whole process and how you know we are emphasizing on, on learning and adapting, uh, which I think is great. Uh, so moving on, where are we with this playbook currently, Isa? Uh, what stage of development is in? Is it in? How far are we? Sure. Uh, so the playbook is live. Uh, the links and all will be shared later on. And it is a very in-depth guide and look at artificial intelligence and very much for anyone looking to get into it, especially since it was built with a lot of emphasis uh, and participation from healthcare uh, systems and workers. But it's a very good guide for just about anyone. And on a tangent, I'm looking forward to when we can start releasing these resources without having to define artificial intelligence and machine learning, but that's gonna be a long way out. Um, and as well, the theory of change and theory of action that were developed are out in very simple PDF. So uh, the next stages are just gonna be getting more people and partners implementing the playbook and starting to identify how it can grow, how it can continue to evolve and how we can make it more useful and helpful for the people out there. Uh, thank you, Isai. And I, I guess, you know, you have a dream that one day AI will become, you know, normal language and we all join you in that dream and hope that happens soon. And I think tools like this playbook will go a long way in, you know, setting us up for, for that dream to be achieved. Uh, again, Isa, staying with you since you are, you know, sort of on this panel today, you are our main Tanzanian AI player. I mentioned AI is your playground. So, you know, having the experience that you have, uh, what are the possibilities with this playbook? And also, what are there any prerequisites that are required for someone who wants to use this playbook? What are things that, you know, different partners and all need to consider? Sure. So with the possibilities, it's, it's very open because, like I said, it looks at a very in-depth guide into, first of all, understanding the technology. And that's what we find to be one of the most foundational aspects for implementing it. Because um, like Benjamin was talking about, if we can get rid of that fear and that unknown element about the technology uh, to demystify it, make it as simple as it really is a lot of the aspects that are applied and deployed in the real world these days are very simple uh, aspects of it that aren't things to be feared. We are not talking about the terminated style of things. You're talking about Y is equal to MX plus C. Those people uh, who still remember high school mathematics, of course, it's not that simple, but it still is pretty simple elements of it. So that opens up doors for a lot of things. And as much as this is made for, uh, for as a guide and a playbook, it'll still highly encourage interaction between the different levels of experts. But this is here to act as that middle ground, level the playing field a bit and uh, bring everyone onto the same page or same book in this case. And, through that, the possibilities are just open and endless and it's just going to be about applying it. But of course, there will be some prerequisites, which is as much as we can talk about applying the technology, there will be uh, the things we need to make sure are ready. The technical infrastructure is necessary. We talk about how the technology needs the data foundation, the rules uh, or the predictive element of it can't come out if we don't have the data foundation. If we don't have the data to train the models, 
then we're not going to get a model that works. Therefore, we need that infrastructure, that data, that relevant, realistic uh, data that can be used to create these models to be present. Otherwise, we'll need to take a step back and start that exercise, identifying the data that needs to be collected, relevant data, accurate data. And if we don't have that in place, then it's going to be very difficult. And for that to be um, foundational is where all of the other aspects come in. With the right partnerships and strategy, it becomes easier to collect all of that. With the policies and strategies in place, we know how to make sure that the fundamental systems, the necessary systems are collecting that data. If we do not um, uh, enforce or require or encourage the correct data collection, we know in different systems in different places how um, if it becomes too much of an arduous process, then people are willing to cook that data. And if the data is cooked, then that does really not help us. Um, the knowledge and skills is an aspect that we see is growing a lot quicker, uh, especially compared to technical infrastructure because of how available it is. But as we look at deploying and building the systems on ground, the need of this is going to keep on rising. And coming back to the technical infrastructure, we still will need people who are familiar and understand data systems, uh, data algorithms and structures, things like that. And of course, money. Uh, all of this needs money at the end of the day. The financial aspect will never uh, disappear on us. We can only do so much pro bono. So yeah, all of these will be very strong prerequisites to implementing the technology um, as the playbook uh, guides and suggests. But a prerequisite for going through the playbook is just having the time and the interest. It's open to anyone. And as we'll share later on, anyone can access it. Okay. Uh, thank you for that, Isa. These are definitely, you know, important things to consider. But, you know, going back to the uh, history that Harrison gave us, you know, Tanzania has sort of always been uh, uh, a leader when it comes to supply chains and, you know, implementing new systems. So clearly, we've shown examples of, you know, will and support uh, from different stakeholders in the past. And I definitely believe we can do that again with this technology as well in order to improve our uh, health supply chains. Uh, at this point, I just like to remind everyone, please do feel free to share your questions, your thoughts. Uh, we would prefer you do it through the Q&A button that is at the bottom of your Zoom screen rather than the chat so that we can track them properly. Uh, but yeah, feel free to share your thoughts, comments, your questions. Uh, now, from the, you know, from the participants I'm seeing and also from some of the questions, Ben, and, and I generally believe because this has been shared through the IAPHL platform, we definitely have people who are outside of Tanzania, right? It's not just uh, Tanzanians who are on the webinar today. And, you know, we've been saying that, you know, this tool, although it does have you know, use cases from other parts of the world, but it seems to be tailor-made for the Tanzanian uh, supply chain. However, can the book, the playbook be adapted and used in other countries as well? And how can they do so? Yes, of, of course. Um, the, that's, that's the whole idea. Um, and and um, I, I think that the, the fundamental elements of de-risking, giving somebody the ability to walk through the steps, the process, what's possible in a very safe way, um, that's valuable for anyone in the world, um, whether you're in the United States or whether you're in Cote d'Ivoire or whether you're in India. Um, a very concrete example of this a very concrete supply chain example of this is that this year Macrise won a contract to deploy a component of our supply chain technology. So this is demand forecasting. And this is this capability to use machine learning to predict when and where supply is going to be used with unprecedented precision and accuracy. Um, we are working with the government of Cote d'Ivoire and we are using many elements of this playbook. Again, um, there already was 
interest within the government of Cote d'Ivoire. That's why they engaged in this global competition to find a new approach to demand forecasting. But even with interest, there's still concern. There's still questions. Um, and we see this playbook as a, as a, a clear way to walk through that process um, before it happens in the real world. So maybe a, a version of sort of walk before you run. Um, again, emphasizing that the best way to understand AI, which is perhaps the most important technology of our time, is to work with it directly. Um, first the playbook, and then experiment, and then scale. Back to you, Farhan. Uh, thank you. That does seem uh, to be quite useful in all settings, really, Ben. And, and I think it's going to be a great tool. And, you know, on behalf of all the teams here and, you know, everyone who's worked for this playbook, we will be looking forward to feedback from everyone. Please do not feel shy. Just uh, reach out. On that note, Harrison, you know, you have, again, the task of telling us how can people access this playbook and also, you know, how can they send their feedback and, and those elements of now actually using the playbook. Um, uh, thank you, Farhan. So it's very simple. Uh, they just have to go to the website, uh, the InSupply website, uh, which is on the um, screen right now and on the publications area, they will be able to access uh, this playbook alongside with the theory of change and theory of action, which was actually used in developing this um, play, uh, this playbook. And thank you, Farhan. I see you've just pasted the link on the chat. So everyone, please, you can use that to go and access and download the playbook. Um, we think also you can continue to engage with the facilitators here and also get access or ask any questions after the after the uh, webinar as well. So welcome. We really, really are looking forward to seeing people use this and actually um, improve our health supply chain. So like I said, we are starting the new decade of excellence in our healthcare supply chains and we want everyone to start on the right foot. So we think this is the first way to, the best way to start. Thank you. Uh, thanks a lot, Harrison, for that. And yeah, as you mentioned, I've put the link on the chat. And Harrison, just another question. So if people want to send feedback, is there a place on the website where they can do that? Or is there another way? Um, I believe so. But um, either way, I think, uh, please, uh, I will also share um, my contacts if, for anyone who is uh, on the on the call today to send any questions, any feedback. We really are looking forward to it. And I think we'll share, we'll share this for the IPHL community. We we'll hope to share also um, uh, later on, like a survey after seeing, going through it, if you found it useful. So looking forward to it. Okay. Thank you so much. So Harrison, maybe if you can put your contact or your email or something on the chat for people to respond to. And I think another idea would be to maybe have a discussion thread on the playbook on the IAPHL forum. I think that might be quite useful as well. Uh, so I think as far as our discussion goes, this was the end of it. We can now move to the questions. Before we do that, I had mentioned earlier on in the call that, you know, for those people who might have joined late, this program today is hosted by the International Association of Public Health Logisticians, uh, IAPHL. And if you are not a member, please, you can join. Uh, the link is in front of you. And later on, I'll put it on the chat as well. Please do join IAPHL to learn, to share to grow your expertise as far as you know, supply chains and particularly health supply chains are concerned. In Tanzania, we say karibu sana. Uh, so I guess now we can move on to the questions. I did see some have come in already. For those who still have questions, please uh, keep them coming. I will start reading out the ones that I'm seeing right now and maybe, so I'll allocate them to different panelists based on my judgment, but please, if any, panelists feels like they can add, please do so. 
Uh, so I see question number one. I think I would direct this to Harrison. How AI is enforcing collaborating among health supply chain system stakeholders? So I guess the question is how has or how is AI currently enforcing collaboration between different players within the health supply chain in the country? Um, thank you, Farhan. So I think um, in, in this, uh, I saw during the uh, playbook when we we're developing this, um, it really, really helped, for instance, to bring together the private sector supply chain actors and the uh, public sector supply chain actors. And we learned quite a, a lot on what was working in, in both areas. And we found um, some of the challenges also in the private sector health supply chain, which um, though it's uh, performing well, but there are actually other challenges like integration and um, people lacking visibility because of the siloed uh, leader system that are in each area. Um, so we, it, it really helped uh, um, uh, like this conversation as we are working together towards seeing the best way to implement this technology is bringing all, everyone together to speak about the health, healthcare supply chains and see how we can improve uh, together because if you, if you look back at our current um, health supply chains, um, they were they in their development, uh, we benefited a lot from uh, investment in the public sector. And this is because it was uh, program driven maybe when we were uh, fighting the uh, maybe HIV uh, uh, um, incidents, then we, we use that support to develop the ELMIS. So it's sometimes these tools that we have are very um, public sector facing because that's the channel that we have used to um, we've used to uh, to provide access to these infectious diseases. But now that we in this in this era, like talking about the next ten years, we can see NCDs coming in, and then uh, our current systems may not provide the best solution if we follow just the public sector uh, stream. So we. We believe these uh, discussions and the flexibility and fluidity that um, AI can help uh, will, will really uh, help also to bring these two sectors together and together we'll be able to address some of these challenges that uh, we both want to solve. Thank you. Thank you so much for that, uh, Harrison. And I see there's a comment on the chat that you know really emphasizes on this i believe it's one of the local stakeholders who are you know talking about uh, their willingness to use this in immunization service uh, delivery this technology uh, moving on to the next question uh, and i'll direct this to ben ben what are areas with respect to decision support uh, that ai is helping in Tanzania. So I, I guess maybe, you know, talking about that example that you gave, I, and my gist of the question is, you know, how is it helping in decision making or, you know, decision support? Well, I, um, I, we are in the midst of, of, of carefully deploying our technology for decision support in a supply chain context. So I think about this as replenishment. I think about this as demand forecasting. Um, these are very complicated decisions, difficult decisions for a team of experts to get right each time. Um, they're the why and when a large number of people will opt to show up at a, at a health center um, and use or purchase um, a health product, a vaccine. The, this is the result of many different factors, environmental, social, um, transportation. Um, there's data that describes all those factors, but it's vast, it's complex. Um, this is, I would say almost the perfect use case for AI in a decision support context. So an, an expert can be in the loop, as we say, an expert can, can be present to observe how this technology is generating those recommendations. But what we've shown carefully over, over years is that consistently this system makes extremely high quality forecasts. 
So consistently, the margin of error is significantly less than the margin of error in, for conventional systems. And again, this is, this is because of this capability to learn, to learn from new patterns in the data, to learn from a wider array of data. So to summarize, um, I think in a supply chain context, the, the, the work that's happening right now, where a recommendation of what to send to which point on the map based upon what will be used. This is a, a, a very exciting use case because it's, it, it's almost the perfect use case. Thank you for that, Benjamin. So just in the spirit of you know, making all my panelists speak, I have a question for Isa. Uh, and this is a question that I think will be beneficial for our participants. So Isa, you said that you know, in Tanzania in particular, you manage an AI community, right? So tell us how can you know, our participants engage with that community? And also on that note, I know the community does a lot of work in terms of like capacity building for AI. So maybe talk a little bit on how individuals may want to you know, build their capacity further in, in artificial intelligence. Sure, thank you. Um, but before I go for that, um, I wanted to uh, slide in a comment uh, related to the two previous questions about supply chains and uh, decision making support for the stakeholders. So um, the, there is the one aspect of it where uh, where a lot of the work like Macris and uh, is doing and uh, looking forward with the forecasting and interestingly there's been a different solution developing that's currently in the prototyping that's also kind of looking at the backward side of things um, which is uh, making the data more easily available so uh, automating the access towards uh, data so that it becomes easier to make decision support uh, so it's currently in prototyping and they're looking at making it intelligent uh, requesting of data and visualization uh, so that people within the supply chain, the stakeholders can all be looking at the same data in very summarized formats without having to go through a long process of report requesting and something like that. Being able to just request over social media, WhatsApp, message a number and get all the necessary statistics you need immediately. Uh, no gaps, no waiting. So that is something that's in development. I'm not going to give too much more information about it just yet, uh, but it is something that will be coming up soon with quite some force. Uh, so in reference to the AI lab, um, well, the easiest way to get involved is through our website, um, ailab.co.tz and it's a very open community. So we welcome everyone, uh, be it with ideas, be it with specific requests for types of trainings. And currently we're in the process of creating an uh, ethical AI uh, guideline, not guideline, but sort of short training because there is one aspect of implementing the technology, but now with the use of data and privacy, we are looking into the element of ethical use of the technology and implementation. Uh, so that is something that will be coming soon. Mm. And through that is just very much open community. So anyone can get involved and we post a lot of the information through our social media, telegram groups, etc. Um, was there anything else I'm missing that you had asked? Uh, Isa, just in terms of like capacity building, but I guess people can engage further with the AI lab to learn a bit more about that. And maybe if you can uh, put the link again in the chat, it, it might be helpful. Uh, moving on, thank you so much for that, Isa. I think uh, that's quite helpful. Uh, I have another question here, and I think this is, you know, between Harrison and Ben, whoever feels like you know, your better place to answer it. So does the policy and strategy include legal and regulatory framework to support AI uh, use? Example, data governance, sharing, protection, and, and all that. And I think that's a, it's a very interesting and, and relevant question. Uh, so who from the two wants to take that one? I see Harrison smiling a lot. So maybe you should start and then Ben, ben will add to it. I think that uh, those are that's a very good question, and um, those are very valid concerns. Um, um, we want to always make sure that 
um, people are protected, uh, especially the data. And we've seen uh, concerns over um, many, like you, the, the talk is there about how people are not misusing data. But um, and this is where now uh, we can learn from experience. Um, it's not the first time that we're interacting with this supply chain data. Like the data is there within the ELMIS, it's there within the vaccines information relation systems. It's there and it's being used. It's just not being used as it should be. Like uh, we, we, we are looking at the, like Ben said, we are looking at the past. We are not using it to predict what's gonna happen and preventing it. So what is changing is more towards like a more proactive use of the data rather than not like using or not using the data because currently uh, most of it we are using uh, 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 like ben said there is a lot of even of publicly available data that can be used uh, to good effect so um, at the same time uh, uh, it's important to to make sure that uh, there are policies for this and i think the current e-health strategy also uh, for tanzania mentions uh, ai as a use case and how that uh, can go about so i don't want to dive deep into that but we definitely uh, came across those concerns and we address some of those within the playbook as well so uh, again welcome thank you maybe if i can farhan if i can add a, a a couple of thoughts to, to, to what Harrison described. So yes, sure. um, AI actually takes away an element of risk that what I call a transactional system, what Harrison described as a system that describes the past, has. And, and just, just so that we're all clear, every country in the world has transactional systems within government and, and the private sector that collect oftentimes very sensitive data and represent that data directly. This is what happened. Again, if we return to the core component of AI, which is learning, machine learning system is not going to represent or share the data directly. It's going to present or share what is learned. So if I am a part of a database, a machine learning system is not going to present my personal data. It's going to present what is learned from many people, what is learned from people like me. Because of this component of learning and because of this component of, in a supply chain context, prediction, there's less of a risk of violating or unintentionally sharing private information. I'll, I'll, I'll pause there because I, just to make sure that that, that makes sense to, to, to everyone who's speaking. I, I believe this is a very important point. Um, I'll just summarize it again, that in an AI system, there's actually less risk than in a conventional data management or transactional system because we're focused on prediction, because we're focused on learning, not directly transcribing or representing the data that's collected. Okay, I, I think that that makes sense to me, Ben, and thank you for that. Uh, and I hope it does too to, to our audience and our participants uh, listening. And uh, I guess, again, you know, if uh, there is further clarity that's required, they can reach out to you know, all you guys, I, I think, you know, further answers can be derived from there. Uh, we have around six minutes left. I'm trying to juggle between some questions and also thinking about how we summarize towards the end. Uh, there's one interesting question that I saw that I think is, is, is good for, uh, again, either Ben or Harrison to answer, or maybe I'll ask Ben. So one of the participants has asked that, you know, uh, what or how does the playbook work? Is it a mobile app or a desktop app or a web app? You know, so so maybe I, I think, I guess this is also partly because people haven't seen the playbook, at least some of them who are joining. And I know, you know, Harrison spoke generally about what it uh, consists, but maybe uh, Ben, it might be helpful to make it more uh, practical. So I know you gave the example of how it is being used 
for you know the vaccine system in Tanzania, but is it possible to get a bit more technical in terms of what data we are using? How is it being manipulated? I don't know if that's possible, but just because I see this question, I think there might be uh, some clarification required in terms of how exactly all this works. It, Farhan, just so I clarify your clarification, are you asking, is, 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 is the audience asking about how the machine learning works or how the playbook works? That's I, 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 I think it's more so the question as I'm reading it is, what does the playbook work? Is it a mobile app or desktop app uh, or a web app? You know, so, so I guess just to ease that, I, I think you get what the person is trying to ask. Oh, okay. I, that's, that's easy to answer. Um, so, so the playbook is, is a document that you can download um, and you can read it. You can print it out. You can read it on, on the web. You can read it on your computer. Um, and again, the idea is that it will walk you through a process. It will walk you through some use cases, some examples. It will describe the, the elements that are involved in deploying AI. Um, does that answer the question? Uh, I believe it does. I, I definitely think it does. And also, you know, seeing uh, time, I'd like to give, you know, all the panelists, yes, the person replied yes, so clearly uh, that answered. Uh, I would like to give, you know, a quick 30 seconds to each of the panelists now for any final words or guidance or advice, aside from saying use the playbook, uh, but anything else uh, that you guys want to uh, say to the audience today? We'll start off with Isa. Read the playbook. I didn't say use, I said read. <laughs> but yeah, beyond that, I mean, the most important thing is if artificial intelligence sounds scary, um, get someone who's been applying it to explain it and you will realize that it's one of it can be a very boring thing honestly like getting into it it can be quite boring and you won't be scared anymore <laughs> that's a nice way to remove fear Lisa. thank you harrison well <laughs> i i i was scared earlier on but i think i found my i found my way uh through this playbook and i am currently uh, even working on solutions uh to support healthcare supply chains and for me i started with a use case that's easy to explain uh to demystify this so it's uh, it is I'm, I'm building chatbots uh logistics assistance that can help uh health uh, the healthcare work, workforce like in making those de logistic decisions. So it's very simple and uh, something that uh, anyone can interact with and get a, a, a picture of like what AI could be and has the potential to be integrated with uh, more complex or more robust uh, machine learning solutions. Looking forward to further discussions in the future. Anyone in the audience, thank you. Uh, thank you, Harrison. So as I'm going to ask Ben to give his uh, admin team, can we please move to the slide of how people can download the, the playbook. I think I see some questions around that, yes. And it might be helpful for people to see that as we wrap up. Uh, yes, Ben, your words of wisdom. Mm. That's a, um, these are not words of wisdom. Uh, just that, that I, I hope that this is the beginning that uh, to, to echo what, what Isa said, you, you read it and then you start doing the interesting stuff. I, 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 um, <laughs> I, uh, I, that's true. AI can be boring, but it's also, I mean, what makes us human is our capability to learn. That's, that's really the most remarkable thing about us as human beings. And this is technology that can learn as well. Um, and that's really why it's so powerful. Um, it's taking some of the, the, the best elements of, of, of our brains and, and, um, deploying it across vast amounts of data that, that we can't work with directly as human beings. Um, and I think that, I personally think that supply chain is, um, it's probably one of the most important domains for the use of AI um, because a, a, an effective supply chain is really built for the future. It's, it's designed to ensure that people have access to what they need um, when they need it. And that, 
that has that has to require a, a, a future frame of mind. And this is a technology that allows that system to think about the future much more precisely, to anticipate the future much more precisely. So I hope that this is the beginning of many, many, many instances of, of using AI safely and, and, and effectively um, in supply chains across the world. Thank you so much for that, Ben, Harrison, Isa. I think this was, uh, I learned a lot personally, and I think so have our participants today. Thanks a lot for your time and for sharing your experiences with us. For those who joined us today, thank you also for your time. We do hope as a team that you, uh, you know, are able to use the playbook, send the team's feedback so that it can be improved and definitely join the IAPHL network so that we can engage further. Asante Nisana and hopefully interact with you in a, in a future setting. Thank you. Thank you, everyone.